to today we have uh, Knut Witkowski uh, discussing a paper called Mindless Statistics um, by Gerd Gigerenzer. And um, I think we should go right to the presentation um, and we'll, we'll let Knut do that without any interruption. Okay. Can you get, make me the presenter? I sure can. And then I'll, I'll say a few words uh, at the start of the discussion as well to orient people. Okay, if you accept the screen, then it will be you will be the presenter. Okay, so where stop screen sh uh. share your screen. Say yes. Yeah. There you go. We're seeing your screen now. Okay, we are ready to go. Yeah, go, go ahead, Knut. We'll uh, get started now. Okay, I have the pleasure to present an article that was written some time ago and with the audience for before psychologists and sociologists, but I think it has a lot broader applications and is as urgent and as recent as one could think. The paper is by Gerti Gigerenzer, and it's called Mindless Statistics. It's talking about two problems people have with doing statistics, presenting statistical results in the research. And because he is a psychologist, he gives a very interesting interpretation that helps us to understand why so many things are going wrong. So the first thing that he observes is that people are not really thinking about the alternative hypothesis that they are addressing and then that a significance level is chosen that is not well justified. And then he says this applies to social sciences, but I would, as I said, I would like to extend that and in particular to talk about applications in genome-wide genome association studies. Okay, the first thing that he starts with is a quote from Fisher. And I will read it slowly because I think I mentioned it before in my last presentation and I think it's still important to think about that. No scientific worker has a fixed level of significance at which from year to year and in all circumstances he rejects hypothesis. He rather gives his mind to each particular case in the light of his evidence and his ideas. Sir Ronald A. Fisher, 1956. And I'm reading it slowly and I would like this to sit there for a few seconds because I think it's one of the biggest and most consequential mistakes we make in statistics that we still have not accepted this view of Fisher from 1956. So who is to blame? And now I'm quoting directly from Gerd Gigerenzer's article. He describes a smart graduate student who didn't want to have problems with his thesis advisor. And then he was concerned that he wouldn't get a real job if he doesn't use the 5% significance level. And then he had to deal with editors who required it, and then he was teaching, when he was finally teaching a statistics course, he, he, went, he was teaching it. And now my interpretation is, that was not in Kurtz, that he could not prevent his students from comparing his teaching to his publications. And then there would have been a conflict with all his publications before, and all of them would be be seen as wrong in the eyes of his students. And so he couldn't, so he had to stick to it. And so it gets perpetuated and perpetuated and perpetuated. Another problem is uh, misinterpretation that Gert, Gert also uh, is presenting. 
he wrote that in Neiman Pearson theory, the meaning of alpha of 2% is the following, and I quote, if a hypothesis is correct and the experiment is repeated many times, the experimenter will wrongly reject H in 2% of the cases. And then he quotes Fisher, that one does not repeat the same experiment again and again. And of course one does not. The problem that both have is that they are not appropriately quoting Neumann and Pearson. In 1933 they said, we may search for rules to govern our behavior with regard to hypothesis of a given type, in following which rules we ensure that in the long run of experience with different experiments, we shall not be too often wrong. It is the long run of experience and not the long run of repeated identical experiments that Nyman Pearson were talking about. And I've heard that many times, and I think it's one of the reasons this misinterpretation that people are getting confused and rejecting the idea. Why are they getting confused? And God has an interesting idea. He says that, in effect, the three parts of our personality, the über-ich, the ich, and the es, or the super-ego, ego and id, are somewhat in conflict in all of us. But the super-ego is Nyman Pearson. We clearly state the null and the alternative hypothesis. We determine an we determine alpha and beta by the risk of false decisions of type 1 and 2. We are determining the sample size. We are, our aim is to make a decision, and we're making no statement about the truth of hypothesis. The ego, Fisher, says, well, that's too much. Uh, we're just going by the null hypothesis. Significance we are computing later, better we are ignoring. Sample size are done by rule of thumb. Just our aim is to get the paper published, and so on. And then there is the S, the emotional. We have a continuum of hypothesis. We're blocking the intellect from understanding that the probability of a disease given the hypothesis is something else than the probability of the hypothesis given the disease. We have a lot of wishful thinking, and we misinterpret posterior belief as probabilities. So we all carry along these three traits of our personalities. And because they are in conflict, our decisions are often not rational. And then we are solving these problems by accepting social rituals. And the elements of these social rituals are we are repeating the same action over and over without too much thinking about it. We are focusing on special numbers, in this case 5%. We are driven by fears about serious sanctions for rule violations from teachers, mentors, and editors. And we're driven by wishful thinking that uh, leads to delusions that virtually eliminate critical thinking. So we have these three Freudian aspects of our personality, and they lead the, the unconscious conflict leads us to solutions by accepting social rituals, even when we think we're doing science. And now I would like to apply that to genome-wide association studies. There's this term of genome-wide significance. And it's often believed, stated as being 10 to the minus 7.5. Where does that come from? We're starting out with 5% significance, and we divide it by about a million as the estimated number of tests we are doing with SNPs. Why? We already talked about the 5% not being very reasonable. Why 1 million? Well, in HapMap, we have 2.5 million SNPs in the human population. 
on a chip we used to have 300, now we have a million or even more. When we have 300,000K, 300K, only 83% were informative, others had, were just an A, had a minor allele frequency that was too low, or they were in high LD with an immediate neighbor, or Hardy-Weinberg was violated. With the higher density SNPs, the number of informative, or the proportion of informative SNPs decreases. So yes, maybe there could be about one million of informative SNPs, if it were not for LD blocks. Here I'm showing results that we have just published in pharmacogenomics, where each row shows one SNP and the LD with other SNPs within the same LD block. And as you can see, this SNP here in the first row is an high-end LD with this SNP, with this SNP, with this SNP, with this SNP, and with that SNP. Now with each LD being an high LD with several other SNPs, the number of independent tests that we are actually doing is far less than one million. It is maybe 200,000, even with the highest density chip. So that calculation should be redone. If we have only 200,000 tag sets of genetically indistinguishable SNPs, then we should use that as a number. And we should not stick to 5%, because in an exploratory screening, actually, we want to increase power even if that means that we have to raise our level of significance. So depending on whether alpha is 10, 20, or 50, we would get genome-wide significance levels somewhere between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 6. So we are far off in our requirements from what currently is believed to be the accepted standard. And the problem, this has very severe implications, as indicated by Mail in 1978. Because when we are doing genome-wide association studies, comparing two populations, they, by definition, are different because they are two populations. And they differ in things that are, in other things, than the two diseases that we are interested in, or disease states. So in non-experimental settings like that, with large samples, the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis of nil group differences in favor of a directional alternative is about 50%. So if we do not commit to the direction, we get a significant result virtually 100% of the time. And that was actually in 2004. Waller did an experiment with 81,000 subjects. Now he did that not. And that's a reasonable, that's a number that's now normal with genome-wide association studies, or at least not unheard of. And he included only 511 items, eliminating everything that was barely related to sex, and then he postulated the sex difference, that men perform better than women. And in 46% of these items, these predictions were confirmed often with very impressive p-values. So in large sample sizes, low p-values are to be expected. But that does not guard against model spe spe misspecifications. But we're actually testing a difference that has nothing to do with the difference we're interested in. So that is part of the type 3 error that we're talking about. And so we want to have an optimal answer to the wrong question. It would be far better to get an approximate answer to the right question, something that Hugo is believed to have said in 1962 first. OK, so well, how does that apply to genetics? Common diseases often have several risk factors within a functional intragenic region, the promoter region, an axon. And each is in LD, each of these variations is in LD with another marker through recombination.
so uh, the different markers for recombination. So a significant result in a single SNP is more likely to be an artifact than an indication of a disease association because that's not what we are actually expecting. So when we have large sample size single SNP GWAS, we could go one direction to improve. And that is using larger sample sizes and smaller to get smaller p-values. Now we have already seen that this actually is not the right way to go. The other way is to accept the biological reality that it's not a single SNP that's causing a common disease, not even a single SNP for a particular disease variant associated with variations in a particular region. Okay, here, and that is again from the study in pharmacogenomics, we analyzed the data. And by single SNP analysis, we had one result that reached that mystical 7.5 level. It was in a pseudogene, nothing else. EEF1A1 pseudogene 12. When we do white locus, what we get is quite a number of genes that are significant not all of them at that mystical level of 7.5, but some. When we take all of these, what we see that I have highlighted here, a substantial subset in particular among those that are the most significant, where we would expect the most enrichment with true positives. When we look at them, what we can do is we can align them very nicely along a known genetic pathway that was known to be associated with the disease of question childhood absence epilepsy. It is the RAS pathway that governs axonal, axonal guidance, and it is calcium signaling with ion channels here and calcium storage in the cell down here. So if we have mutations, in a combination of calcium signaling and axonal guidance, then we have the risk of having childhood absence epilepsy. So we have come a long way with single SNP GWAS and some values. We had also a few results that were subset of what we had here, although they would be discarded as not significant. So that is the first thing, this ominous level of 7.5 that lacks any scientific justification that should simply be ignored. And then to make sure that we are actually having an alternative that represents biological reality we should go from single SNP GWAS to wide locus GWAS because that substantially, as we have now shown, increases the power and specificity of genome-wide association studies. And we should remember that it is not confirmatory testing that we are doing. Nothing can be confirmed in an association study. We have a selection procedure where the results lack or are awaiting other types of studies like animal studies or clinical experiments for confirmation. So if we would be willing to actually recognize the conflict that is in our mind between the different parts and desires that we would try that we are trying to resolve and that is cu are currently being resolved by uh, merely accepting a social ritual, then we might start actually getting meaningful result, uh, results out of Chivas. But there is a problem, and I found this cartoon, and I would like to end my talk with this cartoon of the peanuts. This new math is too much for me. Ah, you'll get 
onto it. It just takes time, not me. I never get onto it. How can you do new math problems with an old math mind? Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Knut. Um, so we, we started late, but we do have some time for uh, some discussion and, and questions and answers. Um, and I want to emphasize that this is a, an online journal club. Um, so there is a website for actual written uh, discussion. And um, Bridget, I don't know if we can uh, go ahead and, and show that. Um, and there are a couple sure. of uh, questions posted already. I'm just going to switch the presenter for right now, then I'll show you the website. Pull it back over here. Okay, can everyone see on their screen CTSpedia? I do see it. CTSpedia.org, and then the online journal club is right here. And once you click there, you'll see the, the three that we've had, and this is today's. Yeah, so, yeah, meeting three. And then this is the discussion area. Yeah, so um, everyone should, uh, um, I, well, I, I certainly encourage everyone to uh, make any comments you um, would like here in writing at the... Uh, the discussion site. You can you can add a new topic or you can comment on existing topics. And um, uh, Bob Oster has already posted a couple of questions. Um, maybe the uh, maybe a good one to start out with um, might be about the, the teaching statistics. What what could we do better about uh, um, how we teach statistics to prevent some of these problems? And um, just before we get into that, I, I would like. Um, to prioritize uh, um, further comments and questions as we go along in this discussion that are on the same topic so that uh, we, we finish up each topic before going on to a new one. Um, that way uh, it's much easier for Mary to post in a rational way at uh, YouTube when we post this as, as orientation for the ongoing discussion. And one other thing is that you should all expect to be um, alerted to um, this page and any changes to it, um, probably starting tomorrow night. Um, it, and it will be midnight um, central time every night when there are additions or, or um, changes to this discussion. Although you can opt out of that if you, if you don't like it. So um, let me open it up to anyone who would like to discuss um, what we could do better um, as far as uh, how statistics is taught, and if anyone has comments on, on Bob's initial question here. So I think that one of the most basic things is that we should really teach what Nyman and Pearson have proposed, and that alpha and beta should be selected to inversely relate to the risks of false positive and false negative decisions. And that would be a rational thing, while any fixed, we should simply abandon the fact that there is, there are now, there is probably no situation where 5% is appropriate. And the, it doesn't make sense to teach something that's never appropriate. Well, let, let me uh, um, raise a, a different point of view. Um, I would argue that, uh, in fact, uh, Naaman and Pearson are at the root of the problem. And uh, this goes back to something that was stated in the article several times, that making an automatic decision is often not relevant for science. And in fact, that's generally not what we are trying to do. Um, I would say even the fact that we are trying to publish what we're doing and what we found indicates that we did not just make an automatic decision. We're actually trying to convey information 
to other people and to convince them. And so anytime we are dichotomizing the results of a trial or any type of study with P less than alpha or not, um, we've thrown out a lot of information. And um, that is, I would argue, a more fundamental problem than just how we pick alpha. Um, it's, it's throwing out all this information and acting as if we are making an automatic decision when what we're really trying to do is convey evidence to other people. So, so there are uh, two very different uh, perspectives on the role of Naaman and Pearson here. So would, would anyone care to comment, or, or Knut, would you, would you like to respond? Uh, I totally agree, and uh, that was where, why I said, and th that's where I disagree with your answer, that it is not necessary in a publication to make a decision prior to the publication, because the p-value is one way of conveying information. And everybody reading the information we are putting out there will have a slightly different situation where this might be applied or not, whether he should wants to accept that and act on it or would rather like to ignore it. And so to make the decision whether to accept what's presented there or to ignore it, there are two types of errors we could make. And at that point in time, the person reading should have the freedom to decide what is the, what are the risks in that particular situation and make a decision accordingly, whether to accept the information or to ignore it. I agree with this. Uh, can you hear me? Well, uh, yes. I agree with Newt uh, because, uh, Newt, I'm sorry, um, uh, because uh, the p-value is just one piece of information and there should be other uh, information presented, uh, like for example, two piece uh, graphs or whatever. You know, there should be other information going along in the p-value. Also, the, the actual level of uh, the p-value is important, and I, I, I don't think that it's necessary to uh, pre-specify uh, what is going to be a significant cutoff. It's, that's important, of course, for the uh, sample size statistical power calculations, but um, um, I, I don't think that, that they cannot present the actual p-value just because they, they might think that that, that 0.05 or below might be considered to be significant. And I also agree in what you said that um, the, um, uh, in some cases where, for example, there is a uh, disease that may not be lethal but, um, and the drug could potentially be very harmful, then uh, when, when you're doing um, uh, screening tests and you want to uh, specify a very low p-value. In other cases, you might use a higher p-value for, for significance. But again, that's only part of the uh, part of the information that should be presented in the paper. Well, I should choose the example in GWAS first because I think it's very relevant. And it's also the p-values there serve a purpose. They help us to rank the hypothesis with respect to which set of hypotheses we might want to pick and to move forward with testing the underlying biological uh, principle that is being suggested. And there cannot be, at least in my opinion, a preset uh, level uh, before you, you ha really have to see where do you have still this more genes that fit into the same concept, and where do you not have that anymore, where you're diluting your concept and don't have a hypothesis anymore. So it is something where the cutoff cannot be pre-specified, but is driven by the information that we have in the data. And I think focusing on this, now it's not 
not 0.05, it's 10 to the minus 7.5, and everything that's 10 to the minus 7.4 would be disregarded. It, it is as nonsensical in that field as it is nonsensical in other fields. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Knut is, is pointing out that uh, these same problems are, are carrying over and the culture is carrying over into a relatively new area. Um, I, I would want to get back to Bob's question, though, um, and it does seem to me that, that emphasis on hypothesis testing, the Neyman Pearson framework, um, it is really pretty prominent in how statistics is taught, at least in, in how I was taught, although that was a long time ago. Um, and, and certainly what I see from new trainees also. Um, so uh, that, that would certainly be one way of changing how we do the teaching of statistics. So are there uh, additional uh, um, comments on, on about the teaching question, and I, I think Arlene Ash has her hand up. Ar Arlene, can you uh, give us your comment? Yes. <clears throat> so um, this is part of, uh, of, of a long discussion uh, about uh, the, the mindless way in which people uh, apply the rules and a lot of frustrations that many of us feel when we submit papers and some reviewer tells us, um, um, you know, P equals 0.051, you can't talk about that, it's not real. Um, I found an article that I liked a lot that I'm going to try to post uh, when, I, when I get the opportunity. Uh, I, I was trying that earlier and, and couldn't do it right now. But uh, the title of it is, Do We Really Need the S Word, Where S is Statistical Significance? And it argues, I think, quite, quite correctly that when you have a word that has uh, an English language meaning that is quite different from its technical meaning, it's very hard for these concepts not to leak over one into the other. And um, I think we have some historical um, reasons why people used to report things as P less than 0.05, and that's because they were looking things up in tables in which you really couldn't determine exact p values. You could just see whether something was on one side or another of, of a fixed number of cut points. So at, at a minimum, I think that people have to uh, get to the place where we, where we tell folks, if you're going to re report a p value, you should, um, you should report uh, the exact p value. Um, although if you're talking about a large group of things, then you you can indeed talk about this is the set of things which has a certain threshold. Um, the, the article, do we really need the S word, uh, basically says that, that we should you know, just try to purge that language and talk about um, just try to describe the strength of our findings and use things like p-values in a descriptive sense to help, us, to help us say there seems to be more of a signal here than there. And, um, and, you know, I'd like to try to, in teaching, uh, say, to, say to students, um, to the extent that you can actually write sentences that, that um, you know, that describe your understanding of what the finding means, that's going to always be preferable to um, just, just following some, some rule that says you can't even talk about it if P isn't. You know, you, you, it's, it's a finding of P equals 0.049 and not of P equals 0 0.051. Uh, as for the multiplicity problem that Knut has talked about and whether, you know, whether we should be paying attention to a, a 10 to the minus 7.5 or something different, um, you know, I, that's, of course, the same problem that we come into when, when people are saying, um, uh, with multiple comparisons, should we use a Bonferroni correction? Should we use something else? And I kind of hold hold with people who say, um, if you're going to compute a p-value, uh, it, it at least is something which has a very clear meaning. Um, then you should report 
the singleton p-value in addition to anything else that you do to put it in context. So it's perfectly okay to say, even though this p-value was 0.01, which might you might normally think means something, you have to remember it in the context of the fact that we did 200 tests or 2 million tests or whatever. So that's a few thoughts. Okay, um, yeah, I think that um, certainly relates to, to how statistics is taught. And um, again, I, I would say the theme is that, uh, more emphasis on uh, conveying the emphasis, con conveying the amount of evidence and less on making automatic decisions would uh, certainly be very helpful um, and, and steer students away even at the start from uh, dichotomizing the study's results as opposed to uh, thinking hard about them. Are, are there any more comments about um, teaching or, or um, related to the points that we've brought up in that regard? Well, I think that the, uh, um, at least this paper, My Less Statistics, never mentions uh, uh, the assumptions of the statistical test, whether they're grossly violated or not. I mean, the p-value, is it meaningful? You know, that's another thing. But they just never mention it in this paper. Yeah, so um, are you uh, thinking of that as something that needs more emphasis in teaching also? Well, well I think that or, 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 sh or should we move to a new, uh, discuss that as a new topic? No, I think it should be part of the teaching. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's something that, that could get more emphasis. Although I, I think in, in advanced classes, certainly in the, the teaching we do at UCSF to uh, fellows, um, that is one of the major thrusts in, in each of the lab sessions and so on, is how do you assess the uh, assumptions you're making when you, you use this statistical method. Although I think that is another area where we're often teaching rituals. It is so often that I hear, if the data is continuous, then use the t-test. Uh, if the data, it, it does, con whether the data is continuous or not, uh, you could use the t-test for binary data, and you would have just have a binomial test, that's exactly the same. And there, you could have continuous data where the t-test is not appropriate. So there are. We have the same problem there as we, with the 0.05. It is that teachers are often, and maybe that is an answer to Bob's question, uh, when we as teachers are using shortcuts, trying to oversimplify something for our own convenience, uh, that carries a risk. We should question, and we should question ourselves. We shouldn't say, well, I have to teach that because this is uh, what I have done in the past, so I cannot teach. I cannot say that I learned something new, and therefore I'm teaching something that is different from what I have done in the past. I think and going that is where I see God, God's major contribution, that he actually points to the fact that whatever we do in statistics, teaching or applying statistics, that we are under the influence of these subconscious um, minds. And we have to become a bit more aware of this. And that might help us to become better teachers, too. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, it, it is very hard, I find, uh, not to slip into uh, some of these problems even myself, or, or at least to fail to catch them when I'm reviewing something someone has written. They, 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 the problems seem to have sort of a natural life of their own, which requires a lot of vigilance. Yeah, that's important. Um, Bob, I, I see your, your chat message here. Um, did, did you have any, uh, any further comments other than that these are helpful thoughts? Um, not, well, none off the top of my 
head, except I, I do agree with, uh, I think Edith is the one who said this about, you know, the assumptions for p-values or tests, that those weren't discussed in this article. And I, I think that there's probably several other things that weren't specifically addressed in this article that are uh, re relevant to, uh, I guess, to us uh, perhaps doing a better job of teaching these concepts. But there is uh, there's one thing where the article addresses that issue, and that is the quote from Tukey, that sometimes it's best, better to have an approximate answer for the right question than an exact answer for the wrong question. Sometimes it is necessary or better to use a test even if certain assumptions are violated, because the underlying hypothesis suits our, or is a better fit, than to use a test where the assumptions are justified, but the underlying hypothesis is not a good fit. So I think in that, in that sense, the article addresses that issue with a note of caution on not to overemphasize certain rules about assumptions and rather shift the focus on the hypothesis being tested knowing that most statistical tests are asymptotically distribution-free, and so many of the assumptions are not that relevant, in, at least when we have a somewhat reasonable sample size. Um, yeah, I, I agree with everything you said, Newt. Perhaps I was thinking that there, um, it, we, we could discuss uh, things like you just said in a general sense, but then there's probably a number of statistical topics where we could become more specific and well, I, I guess apply maybe this, this method of thinking to those topics. Okay, well, um, I really I think... like the I idea of using two keys though and elaborating on that to students, that's kind of, um, I don't think that that's something I've done before in, in any class that I've taught. So that's one thing I'll definitely keep in mind. Yeah, um, let, let me just comment that I, I looked uh, closely at the source article for that and the, the quote is not quite as good a fit to the, uh, the, the comment, the idea that Knut is bringing up as um, I might have liked, um, and I think you'll you'll see Gigerens are um, actually citing uh, not the 1962 Tukey paper, but uh, a much later paper by a couple of other people about that topic. Now, so um, I followed up the references to make sure uh, that I go back to the original. So that was the the best I could find. Yeah, but but you know, I I found that Tukey was raising some somewhat different or, or more complicated issues than, than just uh, trying to stay clear on, on exactly what you're trying to do. Um, it was uh, somewhat more complicated than that, not, not as simple as, as the, the point that does need to be made, that you need to uh, focus, as, as you said, on whether you're doing a screening or a confirmatory uh, procedure, for example, which is uh, a very basic point, and I think Tukey's original point in 1962 was somewhat more subtle than that. Okay, well, but, yeah, thanks sir, again. I, I wasn't intending for my question to necessarily take up our entire discussion. Well, I, I think it, it did. Uh, it did cover, uh, you know, some very important aspects of the article, and and. Uh, important aspects of, of what Knut sought to, to bring out in it. So I, I think it was uh, it was helpful. Um, we are 